Welcome to the White Tail Legacy Podcast, coming in your ear holes with episode two of Going Back to the Basic Series. Today, we are talking about the moment of truth, taking that shot, how, how to practice for it, what's some different things you can do. Um, I talked with my good buddy, Matt Taggett from Rec Broadheads on this episode. He had a booth at ATA, and uh, he gave me a seat, and uh, I got to sit down and talk to him for quite a while at the show. He's been supporting the show for, I think we had him back on like episode 40 or something. Um, so he's been short supporting the show for about five years, um, listening and, and giving us content. So I want to return the favor, have him on. Um, this is a really good conversation. Um, it's to have another guy on just to go back and forth on, you know, what, what he does, um, his shot process, what he's thinking when a deer's coming in. And it's, it's, I bet you everybody's a little bit different and a little bit similar, but it's definitely something to think about in the off season. Um, so when you do practice with that bow, you can practice for those shot situations. Uh, let's get into the people that make this possible, get into the show. Uh, start off with the Exodus outdoor gear. Guys, if you're in the market for a new cell cam, the rival Exodus rival is out at $179. Um, that you're getting a cell cam that's going to guarantee last you for five years with that five year warranty. Um, and you're getting um, the best, the best gear on the market when it comes to the quality of stuff that they're making these cameras out of and it's a very basic turn on plug and play kind of camera um they did a live um on their website or and on their instagram if you guys are interested in it you can get there and and see a little bit more content about it um i actually ordered two of these when they get them shipped out i'll get them in my hands really dig through them and give you guys the rundown of the specs and what i think of the camera um but Excited for them. Uh, they got a really good product out at a, a really reasonable price for that five-year warranty. Um, but all right, guys, let's get into the show. All right, well, I got my good buddy, Matt Taggett, um, from the Rec Broadhead on. How's it going tonight, brother? What is going on, my man? No, not much. Like I said, just eating these Dot Cinnamon Sugar Pretzels. I'm gonna, I'm probably going to be eating them with a the mic turned off on my side while you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> not gonna lie i'm a little jealous <laughs> well uh, uh first off thank you for coming on second off thank you for that chair at ata show i don't think people yeah. understand how valuable a chair is <laughs> and there just happened to be an extra one at your booth that i kind of stole for a couple hours i seen you post the uh the uh time lapse on on your camp gopro there and i was sitting down the whole time <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, who's this guy? He's just sat down in the corner the whole time. Yeah, yeah. You took full advantage of our uh, repurposed discount tire chairs there for yeah, sure. They were money, man. But, they were great. Yeah, they were a good addition to the booth. They're super comfy. Yeah. Well, um, I'm going. I'm doing the back to the basic series, and we were talking at the show, and I was like, man, I haven't had you on since like episode 50 or something like that. Um. So wanted to have you on again, and what better way um to do it? for you to cover, you know, the moment of truth, the shot. Um, so how we'll do this is we'll break it down step by step and go through it uh, and kind of do a basic and then kind of more of an advanced. Um, so this is for be beginning hunters to hunters that have been in the game for a long time, just to go over these steps again um, in the off season to prepare us for, for coming into the new season here. But give your 30-second uh, elevator speech, and then we'll get right into the show. Yeah, so as far as elevator speech, what are you looking for here? Oh, for, for just like who you are, what you do. Oh, yeah, right on, right on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, wait, what? Yeah, uh, yeah so uh, Matt Tag with Rec Broadheads. Um, yeah, uh, been around the hunting industry for quite a while. Did uh, um, some uh, film work and stuff like that back in the day. Uh, worked in a little bit of sales and marketing stuff. I've written in some magazines. And a uh, uh, re recent venture is uh, my dad and I have started Rec Broadheads. And uh, so we're we're in the process of uh, building out this company and uh, uh, developing some some kick-ass American-made broadheads and uh, having fun with the whole process and uh, just building relationships and, and staying in the industry we love. Nice, yeah. I uh, it was well. It's how long have you guys been going? I know it was about four years ago when you had started talking about it. Is that when you guys officially started? Yeah, we we officially started working on it in 2018. But what's actually kind of funny that not a lot of people know is um, when my dad was in his 20s, so, you know, a long time ago, he uh, he actually had the expandable broadhead all drawn up um, well before there was one on the market. Oh, that's um, cool. But, 
yeah, it was pretty cool. But at that point he was, you know, just a, a broke 20 year old kid with uh, no, no real knowledge of how to produce the thing or uh, any money to do it. So, um, th- th- just kind of sat idle. And he always told me these stories when I was younger coming up, you know, through the, the bow hunting life and, uh, you know, just kind of, uh, fell together one day we said you know we, we're having so many different problems with broadheads on the market that maybe we should uh, try to design our own head so we went to work on our expandable head and uh in 2018 we started started working on that and by uh january of 2020 we launched our first broadhead and uh we've been running full tilt ever since nice man how cool is that like owning your own business the america dream and being able to do it with your dad like that's just the coolest shit ever to be able to to do and you know, you hopefully, if you ever have kids or anything like that, you'd be able to bring them right in and you have three generations of taggets in there working on this head. That'd be incredible. Yeah, that's that's certainly the plan to, to keep it a family affair all the way through. And there's definitely uh, um, not a better business partner that I'd, I'd like to have. You know, there, there's days when we're uh, going at each other's throats, but <laughs> there's uh, at the end of the day, you know, we work together so well and uh, we've got the, the same vision and, and it's just uh, the perfect perfect team well perfect so getting into this um, we're talking about that moment of of truth the moment that we literally wait for all year and uh you've been in this moment multiple times yourself on film which adds a little different aspect um a little more edge to it um but just go ahead and go through your 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 practice and off season what do you think is enough practice for someone that you know maybe he's just starting out to feel comfortable behind the bow yeah man it's uh you know obviously the the more practice the better i don't think you can ever practice too much um i uh i kind of i've got to admit i did not practice this last season as much as i should have and it kind of uh it hurt me um a little bit early in the season but you know in a typical year i i like to shoot kind of all through the summer you know i I kind of take a little break after deer season and, and get back after, you know, around May or so. And I like to at least shoot, you know, once or twice a month in the off season. And then once, you know, like uh, July and August hits and things kind of start to ramp up, I, you know, I'm picking up that bow more and more often. And, and by the time season rolls around, I like to be shooting, you know, like three times a week. So I think uh, just getting into the repetition of things and just uh, to keep that form true and just, uh, you know, go through the motions is, is a huge part of being able to pull the shot off when you're in the stand. I 100% agree. I know a lot of people that get it out like two weeks before season shoot. And, you know, if you're a seasoned hunter that's bow hunted for a while, I think you can do that and get away with it, especially if you're comfortable with your bow. Is it ideal? No, but you can get away with it, especially if you're not taking anything over 40 yard shots. Um, But for someone that's new, I agree. There's no such thing as too much practice. Get out there, shoot at as much as you can, um, different yardage, different scenarios. Um, anything you can. So what would be, what's one scenario that you like to run through in your mind when you're out there practicing? Man, you know, I'd, I'd try to just, uh, I guess, put yourself in a, into a scenario where, uh, you know, you, you try to visualize your target being an actual deer. You know, a lot of times I like to shoot out of a tree stand once I'm getting closer to season, you know, actually I'll set a stand in the backyard and I'll, I'll put a target out and, you know, or a couple targets in different areas and, just try to replicate, you know, that, that form out of a, a little bit different than, you know, shooting off the ground all summer. So I try to replicate that. There's, there's times when I'll even, you know, kind of do a little sprint around the yard and then shoot my bow just to kind of, you know, get your blood flowing a little bit, you know, a little bit of uh, heavy breathing and stuff. Cause you know, when a big old buck's coming in on you, let's be honest, you're, you're not going to be super calm. No, never. I, every year I think I'm like, oh, I'm going to be better. I'm going to be better. And then last year I was pretty solid this year. I was fired up man <laughs> I, was just, <laughs> I was talking myself through like okay chill, chill out you're cool right um, right one thing i like to do is i like to shoot out of the stand as well um i also like to swing through my shot so like you know i drew now i'm falling i'm falling oh he walked you know i went, tried to stop him i verbally you know matt i'm a matt guy um, yeah, I verbally Matt. Okay. You walk through that shooting lane, follow, 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 get back on target. So what I'll do is I'll set my block up and aim at it. Okay. Like aim. That's where I would shoot. Oh man. He missed that shooting lane, swing through maybe five yards and have my actual deer 3d target set up and shoot it. Um, when I started doing that and actually verbally matting, and then you have to come off that target when you're ready to kill 
swing through and go to the next target and get back on. Um, I've seen a huge improvement in there's there's going to the 3D range and shooting good, and then they're shooting good at animals. Um, and everybody says aim small, miss small. I kind of go right center mass behind the shoulders. I'm a, I'm a man of odds. You know, I'm like, where's yeah, the least yeah. chance of if I, you know, if I raise my arm up, if I go left, if I go right, where, where do I need to be? I go center mass right behind the shoulder and all the deer that I've killed on film over the year. If you look, I'm two inches high above shoulder, three inches high above <laughs> shoulder because yep. they duck down and I'm not, not, I'm going center mass, center mass, get the pin there and shoot. Um, so, uh, that's something that I do that I think maybe not a lot of people do that could be hugely beneficial especially for someone new hunting that first drawback scenario i can't even imagine what that felt like i can't remember you know the actual feeling i remember the hunt but the actual feel you i you you'd just be so jacked up it'd be insane oh yeah oh yeah yeah and i think the more scenarios you can run yourself through in the off season you know it's uh it might sound silly to some but to be able to to put together all those different scenarios um, while target practicing is really just going to benefit you come season because you know you could be as prepared as you want but uh those, those deer are always gonna you know throw a loop at you and do something a little different or come through a shooting lane you weren't expecting and and uh you know when, when it's the moment of truth you got to get an arrow off you know you don't uh it's not always the perfect perfect spot Yep. That two years ago when I killed, it was tight, you know, it was thick and I shot and homie was filming to me. He's like, man, I can't believe you shot. And I was like, well, but if you got past there, there was no other option. You know, I had a clear lane and then this year did the same thing, hit a limb, you know, so it's tough. Um, but when you have those chances, you got to take it. I was a little timid on hitting that limb this year. And after watching my footage of bucks that I was filming this year while hunting, I missed a lot of opportunities to shoot these deer because it wasn't perfect. But I was like, man, I probably could have made that work after watching the film and not being in the situation. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's a, a really fine line there between, uh, um, you know, you've obviously got to remain ethical and, and take an ethical shot, but uh, there's a fine line between missing your opportunity and capitalizing on it, you know, especially if you're, when you're hunting in the timber, you know, it's a little, little slightly, easier i would say hunting over a food plot or a field edge or something of that sort you know you have more opportunity less obstructions but when you're hunting the timber especially in the rut when you know deer are really just cruising around i mean it's uh, it's a whole different ball game yeah you got to be prepared so this is a, a question i like to ask people and everybody seems to have kind of a different method so first um do you stop your deer on the shot or if they're slow moving do you let them continue you know, I'm trying to trying to think of a time that I would have stopped a deer for a shot, and I honestly can't think of one. Um, I would, and I would totally stop a deer for a shot, but I've uh, more times than not had the natural just stops. But uh, had the natural um, stops. That's always nice. Because I know yeah, it's guys nice. That won't stop them because then they're alert. You know, and there's the whole head, yeah the whole head up head down thing. Um, shout out to. I believe it was growing deer TV. I had never like been hunting so long and never thought about the momentum of a head up, head down deer. Um, I always thought a head up deer was going to duck more than a head down deer. Uh, but they go through the process of, you know, a head up deer has got to bring his head down and his body comes with him. And if he's a head down deer and he brings his head up, he can leverage his shoulders and neck to bring his mid torso down quicker i'm like that seems complete opposite when you think about it but they showed it on the video and once they showed it i'm like that i never knew that um i saw that same video and yeah, yeah. it's pretty crazy when they, they they break it down on how much a deer can duck with their head down versus up in in what you would think is the alert position but it's uh yeah like you said kind of the opposite of what you would expect yeah so someone new that's hunting out there or maybe i mean i've been hunting a long time and didn't know this but someone just getting into hunting a head up deer is going to duck less than a head down deer so i'm a stopper i'm a mat guy I've always been a mat guy um i have i don't think i've ever shot a deer this year i shot a deer that was trotting and i like slow walk and that's one of the very few deer i've ever shot slow walking with a bow like i'm always i'm stopping this deer um and a lot of times, which we'll get into the next topic, 
I don't know if it's just me or not, or, you know, I'm hunting a lot of sets or maybe I'm not the sneakiest guy, but I always feel like they kind of know something's there. So they're kind of stopping their self and just looking over there like, ah, you know, they're, they're kind of timid unless it's the rut and you just catch one kind of popping around. Um, right. But out of there, it seems like they're kind of, they always know I'm in the there or they always look over there. Like they know something's there, you know? So, uh, that gets into my, my next question. Um, time in the drawback. Um, what's, what's your process there? What are you looking for when you actually do draw that bow back? Yeah, that, that's a tough one. You know, that's kind of the, the make it or break it right there on, on how long you're gonna have to hold your bow. That's, uh, I, I, I guess when I first get into a stand, you know, whether, um, whether it's a new set or an existing set, I guess that one of the first things I do when I get in the stand is just kind of, uh, you know, visualize where the deer are going to come from and in the, the shot opportunities I have, they open the lanes and that way I can kind of have a, a little bit of a prelude to, you know, potentially where, where I may have to draw, uh, given an opportunity. So, you know, when a deer is coming through, I, I kind of, you know, I have that mental, mental note in my head of where my, my openings are. And then, you know, I can kind of, look up take a quick look like okay he's uh he's got 10 more steps and he's gonna be in my lane so when he gets you know about halfway there then i can i can draw and let him hit it and hope he stops or you know um stop him if you have to and and just kind of for me it's a, it's a lot of kind of pre-planning yeah it's that's a, it's a hard process to to pick the time to draw because like you said you don't want to do it too early but you don't want to do it too late um you don't want the deer looking at you and even if he's looking straight he's still looking at you so he pretty much has to be behind cover or looking the complete opposite direction of you. So you can make that movement, um, you know, in the stand to, to not spook this deer. So I would say, you know, besides missed shots, that's probably the like top thing that saves bucks. I think is people oh, absolutely. at the wrong time or a bad situation where maybe they're with a doe and you're watching him and the doe sees you draw. I've had that happen to me before. She spooks, he spooks, you know, it, it's such a challenging thing. Um, and that's why I think bow hunting's, you know, so much more challenging than gun hunting, not only the distance, but just the fact that you have to have that extra movement, um, to, to pull that bow back. It's you're moving around. I like to stand when I shoot out of a tree stand, I have shot sitting, um, but I would much rather be standing. It's just more comfortable to, for me, but that's something. Are you a sitter or a stander? You know, that that's the topic I was going to bring up, too, is, uh, you know, that that's a whole lot more movement you've got to be thinking about, too, yeah. especially if you have a, a, a field full of, of deer, you know, of does out there cruising around or whatever. You know, you've got that many more eyes out there looking. So you've got to take that into consideration as well. Um, you know, I'm, I'm right-handed, so I, I'm comfortable shooting off my left side, uh, but, if I'm able to stand, I will always stand. That's uh, my preferred shooting. So, uh, it, you know, it, it's, uh, you gotta, you gotta be careful with it. Yeah. That's, that's what I normally like to do. So my process, um, before I draw would be when I first see that deer, my first step, if, if I realize that I'm going to have a little bit of time, I normally have my bow extremely close to me. I have one of the, the bow, the bow holders that's on the stand that I run 90% of the time. If I do have a bow hook, it is extremely close where I literally just barely have to move my arm to get it. It's not way out on one of those, like like the three arm ones that are way out there. They're super nice, super convenient. Um, yeah, yeah. I like to have it really like almost uncomfortably close when you're just sitting there hanging out. Um, but um, if not, it's on. It's actually on the stand. So my first thing is I'm grabbing my bow and then I'm figuring out when I can stand up. And then the drawing comes after that. Once I'm stand up, um, I'm a I'm a stander in the stand when I'm hunting. A lot of times, I, mm -hmm. like, I like to stand and lean. Um, I feel like I'm more alert, more thinking about what I got going on. Um, if I'm standing, I'm more in the game than if I'm sitting. Um, so I I'm standing probably seventy five percent of the time, anyways. But um, that would that would be my process: is get my bow in my hand while I'm watching the deer, you know, I'm watching the deer the whole time come and get my bow in my hand, figure out when I can stand up. If I can't stand up, I'm going to shoot setting down. Um, if I can stand up, I'm a hundred percent going to get stood up. Then I'm going to figure out where my shots are going to take place. And, uh, the more, the more that I hunt, um, <clears throat> and the more mobile setups, you know, 
you think, okay, my shot's going to be here, here, and here. And almost, I would say, half the time I'm wrong. The deer is doing completely something different. Like last year, I had beautiful open scrapes. I had one 15 yards to the left of me, one 15 yards to the right of me. I'm thinking, it's late October. This deer is going to come in. If he comes in, he's going to hit this scrape 100%. Oh, for sure. He went downwind of those 15 yards, which <laughs> in my mind, I'm like, okay, that makes perfect sense. Like, he just cruising downwind um, and literally walked the edge of a field scenting those scrapes and he stopped and like directly by that scrape and was like you know smelling there i knew exactly what he was doing once he was doing it and i was like oh crap so it turned a 15 yard shot into a 40 yard shot um so that's something that in my mind i'm like oh he's gonna be right here in this shooting lane when he actually wasn't and he was further away um but the time that you set up downwind of the scrape he's gonna hit the scrape so it's a, it's a i was trying to play the odds to having you know I could where I could hit both scrapes, whatever one he, you know, he hit. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, um, but that's another thing, just wherever you think the shooting lane possibly is going to happen, make sure you can shoot there, but then also make sure you have a process in mind of how you're going to stand and turn on something that's like, I don't ever think a deer would come there, but maybe I need to figure out if one does come there, do I need to spin in the stand? Do I need to, you know, do I need to go underneath my, my, harness rope what what do i got to do to get over there because if that moment happens <clears throat> then you're trying to figure out in that process it's an absolute disaster because i've been there well then you run into the situation of uh getting the proper yardage shoe like you were talking you know yeah. if he uh uh you know i guess i always like to get in the stand and i like to shoot a couple trees or whatever you know points that i i feel like i can remember okay that's 30 yards that's 45 whatever but in, in the moment of things, you know, when you got a thousand things going through your head, you kind of start freaking out. Like, oh, man, was was that 40 yards? Was that 40 yards? So I always have to, to range again. But that's, you know, you got to be you got to have your range finder quickly accessible in somewhere. You know, you can just pull that up quick and just just to be sure, because, uh, you know, I think we've all probably said an arrow over a deer's back before off the, the wrong range. So I've, uh, I've kind of become a freak about just making sure the yard is right. Even if I've ranged a tree, I just like to double check it. But uh you know, when, when things are happening like that, you gotta, there's, there's so many things you have to think about so many different variables and you're just got, you've got everything going through your head, you know, all the way from, okay, I'm standing up right now. Is the, is the tree stand seat going to fall back down? Is that, yeah. is that far enough back against the tree? Or like you mentioned, the, uh, the safety harness rope, is that out of my way? You know, there's, there's so much going through your head and you have just, you know, a few seconds to make this happen. So you've really got to be on your game and try to, uh, you know, run these scenarios through your head while you're sitting there waiting for the opportunity. Yeah, it's crazy that we're able to pull it off. Like, because there's so many things that could potentially go wrong in that moment. And more than likely, you're not prepared for half of them. You're, you're trying to be prepared, but um, there's this, and, and we somehow, somehow people just pull it off, which blows my mind. Especially those bucks that, like, it's different if you see him out there at like 70 and he's coming and you can range him like 30 times and he's out in a food plot. He's getting a little closer, a little closer. That's different than oh crap, there's a buck on a doe. Like I gotta move right now. Like that's the, exactly that's the stuff we're talking about. And if I, kind of for my my hunting, that's kind of the way it's been for me. It's like uh, there's not a lot of time. It's like okay, he's here. I gotta make a plan and act on it quick. So, um, so you've you've went you went you've got you know you got your bow. You've been practicing. You've been doing the scenarios. You know you you've timed your draw back. The deer's there. The deer's broadside, where are you aiming? Yeah, you know, that's that's something I've struggled with for a long time. I kind of went through a, a, a little, a few years there of like target panic where, you know, I could shoot a target just fine, but then when I go to pick a spot on a deer, I would just have this, you know, I, I just, I had to like, I'd panic and I'd have to squeeze the trigger as fast as I could because I don't know if I was just worried, you know, the pin was going to settle off the deer or the deer was going to move or whatever it was. So I'd, I'd end up rushing the shots, but I finally have been able to, uh, you know, kind of, I'd say a little bit narrower than like a center of mass thing, but I always, first thing I do is I find the shoulder and I just step back from there, you know, a little bit. And I, I still try to get the arrows off pretty quickly. Cause you know, a lot of times uh, these deer are, are moving and, you know, you have, you have them still for just a matter of seconds. So, um, you know, I think that's, uh, obviously there's the aim small and miss fall theory, which is, <laughs> I found to be a little harder said than done. Yeah, me um, too. hundred percent agree with that. Like that's, you know, when, when you're, you're in the first, moment, yeah. When you first start bow hunting, that's what people say, you know, aim small, miss small. Um, but when you're in the moment, there's, you're like 
point of shoulder back there, center mass, send it. You know, like that's our my process. But if someone can go, all right, three inches back, two inches low, that's my spot. I just can't do that in the moment. I, I'm I'm not there. But um, are you a uh, are you a shoot the duck guy? Or are you a mid range like center mass? I got a lot of comfort zone. Um, what what type of guy are you there? I guess for me, I, I, I kind of, uh, you know, a little bit center, but a little bit, you know, close to the shoulder. I always, I get afraid of that shoulder too, though. You know, I know there's a, there's a, a, a good chance with the, the arrow setups I'm shooting, you know, that you're going to penetrate through the shoulder, but then again, you know, there's always a chance you're not going to. So I, I try to back off the shoulder, which has caused me to hit a handful of deer in the liver too, you know? Mm-hmm. So there, there's, there's just that fine line of, you know, even for center mass, but not too far center. Cause then you're, you're, uh, in the stuff you don't want to be in too, but you know, it's just, uh, I, I really, I bring it to the shoulder and I always just try to back off it a handful of inches. And, uh, that seems to work out pretty well for me. Um, yeah, it seems like we kind of have the same process. It's really cool. We've talked honey multiple times, but you never like break down the details like this. Like where do you aim when you shoot? Like no one ever asked you that. Like no one, no one ever's like, what's your, what's your drawback process? Like everybody's like, Oh, how'd he come in? You know? so. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely an interesting topic. I don't think there's a lot of people have uh, have, have talked about it. And I don't know if there's been a podcast about it, but it's uh, you know because there's there's just so many thoughts, and just to hear everybody kind of dissect yeah, their uh, be cool their process here is kind of cool because yeah, people's opinions. It's all so and, similar, but it's so different at the same time. Yeah, there's people that probably worry about the release what a lot more than I do. I don't have a thumb release or a wrist release. I I shoot a wrist release. That's another thing that like those guys that have a back tension release, like the whole entire time I would be drawing. I'd be like, Oh God, I got to stay on. I got to stay on. I got to stay on. Oh yeah. yeah. I would be so nervous of that. No, (laughs) no. See, I've got this weird thing. I I, I shoot a a wrist strap uh, release as well, but I have this weird thing where I tuck my thumb back behind my neck just to kind of like, it helps me stabilize everything I feel. It's this weird little habit I picked up, but I've got to do it. So every time I pull back, I like that's probably my first thought is okay, is my thumb locked in? You know? Yeah, you're like, okay, my, I go from it's thumb like a, locked in. A sign of comfort. You know, you're like, right, it I'm is, good. it is. Yeah, good. Okay. And it, it just, if it's not there, it's like, I don't know. My, I'm not confident in the shot. But then, then I go to looking at the bubble on the site, you know, making sure is that, is that at least somewhat level, you know? Yeah. I do a triple pump, is what I call it. Like I draw back and then I like, to get my kisser good, you know, get get it tucked in there, like triple pump it, like give it a little rock, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. rock it up a couple down and be like, all right, yeah, I'm in there good. <laughs> it's just those simple things that you have that, like I said, no one talks about, but I'll draw back, give her kind of a bump, bump, bump. All right, I'm in there good, kind of nuzzle in there and be like, all right, I'm in the zone. Um, but yeah. Uh, but the, the audio probably got quieter and quieter because I'm literally drew, doing that like people can see me inside my, my house right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, just want to touch on this. The, the listeners that, you know, been hunting for a long time, um, you know, this probably won't give you any any huge knowledge. But broadside, uh, behind the shoulder, quartering away. Um are you a middle of the ribs guy? Or are you behind the ribs guy? Are you still kind of getting it up by that shoulder and maybe getting one lung in the front of the other? Or what's your process there? Yeah, I think it, for, for me, it, it depends on how far they're angled, um, you know, on the according way angle there. Um, the, 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 the more angle they're on, the, the further I'm going to aim back. Um, you know, your target gets a little smaller the, the more they're facing away from you too. But, uh, yeah, I mean – really if they're if they're facing pretty hard away from you and you tuck it in right behind those ribs i mean you're gonna get up into the goods and stuff it yeah. might be a a nasty gut job for you but you know then again if, if he's not courting real hard if you j- punch it right into that offside shoulder you know you're you're right in the boiler room so i mean <clears throat> yeah it's tough so and that's another thing i want to mention you know the quartering away shots um once you start filming your stuff and you you watch where the deer actually was the angle that he actually was 90% of the time, it's the deer isn't exactly how you thought he was when you shot. You're like, man, I thought he was a little more quarter two, or I thought he's a little further quartered away. And then you watch the shot, and you're like, um, I'm never, like, if, if it's quartering away, I'm never like, man, I, that's right where I needed to be. I'm always like a little bit back, a little bit too far forward. I shot a doe um, this year, and I hit her quartering away, and I hit her, and I'm like, oh, dead dead deer dead deer 100 percent dead deer 
never found her. I'm like, really? yeah, I'm like, I, I don't know. It was, and then I watched the shot and I'm like, man, she's quartering a little more harder than I thought, you know, 30, 35, 36 yard shot. Um, but I was just like, ah, I don't, I don't know. You know, everybody makes mistakes, but it's, it burns when you're this far in the game and, and you lose one like that, you know? I'm like, oh yeah. 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 Nobody likes yeah. doing that. Unfortunately, yeah. if you both went long enough, yeah, it's going to happen. I think I angled and just missed, just went up, up the ribs and, you know, missed everything is what I think I did, but yeah. Um, yeah. So our frontal shots, are you a frontal shot guy or what do you think? I know that's a Man, I don't, topic. I, yeah. I'm not really a, a frontal shot. I mean, I, uh, I know there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity up there and a lot of vitals, you know, if you hear a guy shooting in the neck, you hear guys tucking in between the, the brisket and the shoulder and uh, actually, uh, a good friend of mine, he uh, he shot an elk uh, this year out in Montana with that that new FX4 broadhead we've got. He he drove uh, the broadhead right in between the the shoulder and the brisket of that elk, and the arrow zipped clean through and passed out the the backside of the elk. So, nice. I mean, it, it it's definitely uh, you know you can kill deer there, and a lot of guys do, but I don't think that's something I'm confident with doing. Yeah, I don't I don't think I'm confident with doing it as well. Um, one thing I will mention to someone that maybe is in a situation to take this shot, if you are on the ground, I think it's like a 75% better situation than in, if you're in a tree stand trying to take a frontal. Because um, you got to think the angle that you have on a frontal on out of a tree stand is just radical. Like you're, you got to be, but if you're on the ground, you know, the angle is going to be way better to where you actually go through the whole deer and get, get a lot of stuff. Um, so I know a lot of people elk hunting take those shots, but I've never seen someone, I don't know if I've ever seen someone take a frontal out of a tree stand on video or anything like that. Um, yeah, I think, I think like you mentioned, that's a lot about the angle and, you know, the ground, ground being to the advantage there. Yeah. You know, you might not get the best of blood trail unless you, you know, get an exit wound, but, uh, you're, you're definitely going to send it right up through all the goods. Yeah, that's that. Like I said, it's it's definitely not ideal. Um, I have never took a frontal shot. I have took some gun frontal shots, and my gosh, that is devastating. You want? Oh yeah, yeah. You same drop here. A deer, and you got a gun, a slug gun, <laughs> muzzleloader, frontal shot. If you're real confident, and you know, because it's a smaller target, um, you know, but it's it's that's devastating. You're hitting them directly in all the goods with that impact. Um, and they're going to fold right up. Yeah, they're going to fold right up. So I, back in the day, you know, with the 270 in Missouri, you got one walking towards you. You're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he's, he's, a, he's a goner. Um, so uh, just worth mentioning again, I think, the deer duck and the arrow thing, um, the head up, head down. I, it, was it Growing Deer TV that did that? I can't remember. I want to give him credit because I'm pretty I, I, sure it was. but. I feel like you're right. I saw the post. I don't exactly remember who it was, yeah. Um, but yeah, it is it very worth uh, going and looking at that video to, to see what he's talking about here. Cause that was super cool. Yeah, it was in my mind. I'm always thinking head up of more alert. You're going to see the arrow coming. You know, he's going to have time to duck, um, but head down. They, it, they even show the videos. I'm like, man, that's just crazy to me. But um, in your experience, you know, hunting, how much do you think they can duck on a shot that's say let's say thirty yards? You know, I, I've been ducked one time that I can think of, and it was kind of an interesting situation. I think uh, it was a doe. She was like thirty-eight yards out in the middle of a food plot, and I was sitting uh, in an elevated box blind, and I had this is just our theory here. I don't know if there's any science behind this or not, but we had just the uh, the front window open. We had every other window closed in the blind and we just uh assumed that maybe all the sound blew out of that front window directly to her in that plot and filled that plot and just kind of echoed with with sound so quick that she dropped i mean this deer we, we had it all in film and kind of did similar to what growing deer tv did with you know we, we measured out where she was standing before where she was standing after the shot i mean that deer had to have dropped two foot and uh sure enough right over her back but i was just amazed at how you know, 38 yards really isn't that far for, for today's bows. And, uh, you know, it was incredible to see, see that that's the first time that ever happened to me. And I was just trying to think of, you know, why or how that happened. Cause, uh, you know, it was just a field full of deer that were feeding calmly, you know, they weren't on alert or anything like that. And, uh, it was kind of crazy. She was head down then feeding. 
when you uh, she was, yep she was head down which i think goes back to that you yeah. know being able to drop a little bit further faster and whatnot but yeah 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 i would say i was gonna say like a foot at 30 that is like really reasonable to say that they can do like um if they're alert or even not alert um that's that thing like do you play the duck do you not play the duck um because if you play the duck and they don't duck then if you shoot low you're back it's just such a hard situation <laughs> right to, right well, yeah what do you do i mean you know um but i would like i said i would say anybody that's out there maybe just getting to bow hunting or something you know 30 40 yards a foot of duck is not unreasonable like a foot is a lot you're thinking man can they really duck that far um but i've i've been ducked by two deer both does i did get ducked by a buck but i end up finding that buck um got high lung luckily um but that was a sketchy one i was like oh boy i don't know um i shot a 155 inch 10 really really good brows october 15th and uh he went through one of those shooting lanes, and I, you know, Matt, last opportunity I had, shot, had to kind of shoot a touch higher um, to get up over some brush, um, and then he ducked, and I was like, ah, oh, man, but luckily, you know, had the angle, got that other side good, got the top of the one, um, but he did go quite a ways. Um, yeah, yeah. So, and he, like I said, he probably ducked eight inches or so, and he was 30 yards um, so definitely something to, to think about. Um, that's one I, – I had a pretty good um, a pretty good streak of not missing. Um, and everybody's like, why don't – you know, how, how do you not miss? I'm like, well, if you look at my track record, most of my shots have been on big, big deer, like big bucks, so I have a big target. <laughs> and they're sub-20 yeah, I mean, sub yards, <laughs> you know, and they're 25 <laughs> and in. I'm like, it's pretty easy not – to miss big target sub 25 yards <laughs> yeah yeah it's a little easier when they're uh they're 200 pound animals i had that one out at 38 40 this year and hit the limb i'm like see that's why see I, it was just, <laughs> i'm comfortable shooting that far but you don't put yourself in that situation a lot and um that double arrow flight time a lot of stuff can happen and you know seeing a limb at 40 yards that's finger size and low lights a lot harder than seeing one at 20 um, so, yeah, yeah. So getting in, you know, you made the shot on the deer, the deer, you know, it looks like a good shot. He's taken off. Um, what, what is your first thing that you do after your shot? Besides, of course, call your buddies and let them know you shot a giant. Um, what do you do when you, when you're watching that deer running away? Yeah. You know, as soon as that arrow hits its mark, you know, the first thing I'm looking for is what his reaction is. You know, is he, is he bucking? Is he, uh, uh, you know, do you act like he was hit, you know, make sure I don't shoot luminox either. So it kind of makes it tough sometimes to see if the arrow hit and, uh, or, or where exactly it hit, you know, if I've got video, I'm looking back at the video to see, um, you know, I think a deer's initial reaction a lot of times can tell you maybe where you hit him. Um, and then really, uh, his first 30 or 40 yards, how he takes off running, you know, kind of tells you if it's, uh, or at least my, my opinion is it tells you if it's a, a vital shot or not, you know, I've, I've hit him you know, times in the liver or, or even in the guts where they'll, uh, they'll run, you know, 30, 40 yards and just kind of stop and hunch up and just mm-hmm. kind of start wagging their tail doing the little tail wag and stuff. And, uh, um, more times than not, I feel like when you, when you double lung them or you hit them in the heart, I mean, they're taking off like a freight train, you know? Yep. I, I, I agree 100%. The buck that I killed this year did the same thing. He's getting chased by coyotes, ran back through, shot him, shot was back. It was quartering, but shot was back. <clears throat> he walked 80 yards and stood there for 35 minutes. I'm like, well, this dude's yep. going to go down right there. Nope. Tail tucked, hunched up. And you could just tell, you know, he would take three steps and kind of wobble. I'm like, well, he's hurt bad, you know, but um, definitely not. When you can watch him that long, it's like, okay, I definitely didn't get up in into anything really, really good. <clears throat> um, one thing that I will mention that I have kind of keyed in on over the years of, you know, watching deer. If you do have the option to see the deer for a long time, like may- maybe you took a cordon away shot and he-, he does that 30 yards. If you can start seeing blood coming out of the, the mouth and you got past that diaphragm and um, it gives you a really good indication of if you got 
if you got past the diaphragm, more than likely you got liver. Um, and then if you got past that diaphragm, good chance you got one lung, especially if he's bleeding from the mouth. So if you have the option to pull the binos up and watch a deer um, and you can see that he's bleeding from the mouth, that's a really good chance you're going to find that deer. Um, so that's one thing that I kind of key in on that I don't think a lot of people talk about. Um, another thing, like you said, after that shot, make sure and um, watch that deer run away and uh, really key in on that. Um, another thing that I like to do is I don't know how many times I've done it where you shoot the deer, you get down, I shot him right here, and you're like 20 yards off of where you shot him. <laughs> you know? It's yeah, just like, yeah. You're like, there's no blood, and then you walk, you know, 15 feet. You're like, oh, the blood's over here. You're like, man, I thought he was <laughs> here, you know? It's just so hard in that moment. Um, so it we, is. The... Yeah, so marking a spot, especially if you don't get a pass through and your arrow isn't laying there, um, it's one great thing about lighted knocks. If you get a pass through and that arrow sticking out on the backside, you're like, okay, I know exactly where I shot him, like it, right there. Um, but if you know if he's carrying the arrow with him or something like that, it's it's pretty hard to uh, to find find the the location that you hit that deer. Um, I have a really hard time sometimes with my if I shoot a deer with a muzzle loader and it don't go down right away, I it doesn't seem like they bleed like instantly with a muzzle loader. You know, uh, yeah, I, I hear a lot of that too. I think I don't know if it's just the bull is not expanding that they're supposed to, or, yeah, or what not. But kind of, kind of going back to your point, there is it's definitely crucial to uh, to watch the the first you know uh, sprint that deer takes and, and kind of mark some uh, some landmarks of, of where he was exactly because you know it, a lot of times it takes deer a little bit to open up and, and start pouring blood out. You know, especially if you hit him a little bit high, you know that uh, that cavity's kind of got to fill up before it starts really pumping out and. Uh, so to, to have a couple landmarks, of, you know, he ran past this tree or, or this rock or whatever, just to be able to to go right to that point and look for blood, look for your arrow, see what you're working with, and then yeah. uh, then you can kind of make a call on on how to proceed. Go for it after that. So that that's one thing I had here at the end. Um, my good buddy Garrett, I just tracked my buck this year with him, and uh, it went into like CRP grass. That's above our heads and my flashlight by there died so we had his flashlight so we had one flashlight two guys and crp grass and it was three or four inches of frozen crusty snow um we had blood that we could track but it was a far back shot so the blood isn't that good we had a direction of travel but he pulled up his onyx i think um and it had a uh where it would track like where you walked um Oh yeah, and yeah. that's something that I'd never used on a track job, and uh, I I really like that. Like you can mark last blood, and then like tr it it showed us like kind of zigzagging, and we we found last blood where you could see like the deer had like fallen and then gotten back up, you know, and and we were like, okay, it, did he go this way? Did he go this way? And that deer was like fifteen steps from where we had fallen, but that grass we couldn't see him at night. Um, so we did like three or four circles and I got the phone and then we looked at it and Garrett's like, well, we haven't went <clears throat> straight north by the map. He walked straight north 10 steps and he was laying right there. I'm like, no, but it's hard at night to know kind of what you're covering, what you're not covering. Even if you know the ground good, um, that having that was really cool. Cause he was like, well, the only direction we haven't been is straight north. And we went straight north and there he was. So um, definitely a cool little thing to add in on the end that, Something that I didn't know, and I, I'm not saying I know everything about deer hunting, but if I've been along, you know, around as many years hunting, and I don't know it, there's some other bonehead out there like me that don't know it as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's that's a cool feature on a lot of these uh, these map tracking uh, uh, apps they have out now. You know, that just to to kind of gauge how far your track is, you know, because you know if you've gone X amount of yards, maybe you know everyone's kind of got their own little. Uh, uh, formula that, that they like to put together but you know don't that's one thing you, you never want to do is push a, a wounded deer you know so maybe your uh your thing's 200 yards i'm gonna go 200 yards if i haven't found them you know i'm gonna i'm gonna get out of here till morning or or whatever so to be able to kind of track that you know via map and see where you're at with things kind of helps uh uh the whole track and the general direction where you're headed and stuff yeah for sure I know, man this is kind of off topic but have you seen it, those uh those guys there's a lot of tiktok videos going around right now of guys tracking uh deer with uh infrared drones yeah crazy i don't believe it's a, isn't I, that yeah i don't think believe it's legal in illinois 
Um, yeah, I'm not sure if it is in Michigan or e- not or either, but uh, where that's legal, I don't know what it costs, but you know, if you shoot a giant, like you want to recover that deer, um, just the value of knowing if that deer is alive or not alive, like is huge. Like, yeah. Okay. It's been four hours. Like I'm going to call this guy, you know, it's good and dark now. Um, is this deer still alive? Cause then if that deer's still alive, you're going to know exactly kind of, you're going to have a really good idea where you hit that thing. You're like, okay, I'm not in the lungs. Um, more than likely, um, you know, I might've got liver, I'm liver or back. So then you can really start saying, okay, do I need to wait until the morning? Can we go in there tonight? And then like, if you have, he finds him. And even if he's still alive, just think of all the ground that you covered that you would have had to cover by foot to actually find that deer and jump him. Just oh yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a very it's, low pressure uh, way to way to do your tracking and uh, yeah, just just the uh, the to know you know if if that deer is dead or not that is that is worth its weight in gold you know especially when you're talking a, a really large deer that's uh, that's priceless but. It'll be interesting to see how that that plays out here in the future with uh you know the legality in different yeah. states and stuff. I yeah, I can see that being a very important tool. Now the whole scouting your deer herd at night and kind of seeing what quality of bucks you have, what bucks are in the area with the drone. I don't I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's kind uh, of a weird. I know this is kind of off topic, but <laughs> that's kind of a weird gray area where. You know, I know there's a hot topic on the mobile cams, um, but man, if you fly a drone over and you're like, "Yep, this buck's in this in this area," like, even if it, if he has a rack, you're it's gonna be during season. Like, it maybe maybe you're doing it early season in velvet, but you still know that that deer's alive. You kind of have an idea of where he's feeding at night, like 100 percent visual proof that that's him, not just a trail cam pick. And you can kind of watch that deer with that drone for a while. Like, yeah, yeah, he's like, kind of and, kind of crazy. And you're like, okay, I got eight does bedding over here. I got six does bedding over here. I know this is a doe bedding area. I know this is 100% a doe bedding area. Because um, I've noticed throughout the years is sometimes those doe bedding areas change. You know, the neighbor starts hunting the pressure on the edge. They bump a little bit. Or if you're on public, someone starts going in there. The does bump to a different area. They're bedding somewhere else. With that, you know exactly what's going on. You know what deer you got, how many deer you got. You know what deer the neighbors got. Like, I, I don't know. That's that's edgy to me. That's, that's a whole it, it, it is. It is. You know, it's super cool technology. But, you know, when, when used in uh, – some of the ways that I feel people might start using that stuff, it might just be a little too far. But it, you hit a deer, and you and you're trying to track a deer. I believe that you should be able to use any means possible to find it. I'm a hundred percent for using a drone to track that deer, be over there, you know, and be able to find find that buck. Because if you hit a deer, if you hit a deer in the shoulder, good chance it lives in my mind. If you hit a deer behind the shoulder anywhere. Good. I don't think that deer is. He's got a really hard chance getting through our winters. Like. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he's probably gonna die, whether it be you know a few days from the shot or whatever. I mean, that yeah. deer's probably gonna die, and it's uh, you know, as hunters, it's our responsibility to exhaust every effort to find that animal. You know, we we took the shot on it, and uh, you know, yeah, it's it's up to us to hunt him down and track him. You know, there's two scenarios sometimes it's, where, it's tough. where people were like, "Yeah, I shot him, but he's still alive." They shot high. You know, high above mid mid body, you know, and and hit that spot, you know, where the below the spine, or they hit him in the shoulder. Then they get a picture of him, but I've never seen someone that hit like center mass on a deer, you know, or guts or something like that. And he's like, oh yeah, he's still out there. Like that deer's gonna die. It's just yeah, yeah. I mean, he might go die. two miles and not leave a blood trail, but yeah. he's gonna die. He might die in three months. You know, right? But, um homie shot that buck sunshine a few years ago and that deer he didn't stop him he ducked and was on a walk and he shot that deer way back and high like in the ham and we found that deer bedded and he where we found him like in february okay we shot him in october no idea how long he lived um but uh the broadhead was still, it was in the bed of the deer. 
like in the bone. Really? Yeah. And the, he hit that deer directly on the bone, and there was a concave circle where that broadhead had been embedded, like where it had just been grinding on that bone. Oh, gosh. So you're like, man, how long did that deer live? But it yeah. was a ham shot. Like, and it wasn't a ham shot where you're lucky and you get that artery and he bleeds out and seventy-five Right, yards. right. It was a high ham shot, and that deer died with a broadhead in his bed. It was the yeah, craziest that was thing. Crazy. The broadhead's just still laying there. And then I pick up the bow, and I'm like, dude, look look what it did the whole time it was in there. You know, so uh-huh. um, if you shoot, wow. if you hunt long enough, you're going to, you're going to lose a deer. But I believe, like you said, if you shoot something back, it's, it's, if you hit it in the back ham, I don't know, but the, what I've seen, it's, it's a dead deer. Like it just sucks, but it's a dead deer. You know, you get, um, you get up in the back ham and you, there's so much arteries and blood loss and it's such a big muscle um, for that deer to recover, I, I don't know, but, um, it is, it is really cool to be able to, to find a by a drone. i I like all that guy's post. I've been watching his YouTube and all kinds of stuff. It, it's really cool to me. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it's pretty cool to see. I just, uh, hopefully it doesn't become a thing that gets so popular that people start using it for the wrong reasons, but, uh, I guess that's, time that, will tell. Yeah, that's how everything goes, man. You know, remember when that, that trackable arrow, thing was coming out i, I heard something yeah. like that and then it just never i just don't hear anything about it anymore that's what i was wondering is that still a thing or is that did that yeah. kind of fizzle i know it was like i can't remember what company was bringing it out but it was there's was like quite a bit of hype behind it you know and it was like fizzling and then it was kind of like psh, nothing you know so it'd be interesting if people were this kind of comes in hot and heavy and then kind of fizzles out because it seems like he's in ohio and it's legal to do it there um right right Drone deer recovery is who we're talking about. If you guys give him, you know, give him credit if you guys want to look him up. Um, but I don't know. Like, I know Illinois, it's illegal because um, I looked it up. Like, after I seen this guy, I was like, I don't have a thermal one. But I was like, oh, I'll look it up and see what this, the laws are because that's something that I might want to utilize if I hit a deer, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, But it's it's you can't scout. You can't look for them. You can't do anything with drones related to any wildlife at all in the state of Illinois. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, but Ohio sounds like the place to go. Giant bucks use drone. I mean, <laughs> sounds like a good well, spot to be. <laughs> except that football team. I don't, yeah, I don't know yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, I know, uh, I know about that. We got a lot of Ohio listeners. They're going to be like, oh, oh man, <laughs> Michigan in the house. Uh, yep. Um, <laughs> so getting back, getting back on topic here, you know, um, if there's anything that you could tell someone to really help them, at, you know, in that moment of truth, um, a sentence or two that you could you could tell them, what do you, what do you think it would be? Oh man, yeah, I guess uh, you know the the biggest thing you can do is is just take your time, even though you don't have a lot of time, and just make sure that you you see your shot all the way through, you know, and, and uh, do your off season reps and just uh, just treat it like it's another target and. Uh, you know, just, just don't get too worked up, I guess. It's, it's a lot easier said than done, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, you just gotta, you gotta kind of talk yourself through some of those situations and just, uh, tell yourself uh, at least when, when I'm at full draw on a deer, I just keep telling myself, don't screw this up. Don't screw yeah, this up. Yeah, you know, yeah, you, you get thing. one shot. So my thing is that this is your moment. This is your moment. You got to stay exactly. um, in, you know, you got to stay in the moment to, to make it happen. That would be what I would say is try to stay in the moment. Um, you know, don't be thinking about all those things that you got possibly going wrong. Try to stay task by task um, and stay with what the deer is doing and, and uh, not lose your composure. And then if you're not comfortable, don't take the shot. I shouldn't have took, exactly. the, I shouldn't have took the shot this year. I should have waited. Um, the deer was stopped. I was like, oh, this is my opportunity. He stopped. I won't have to stop him in the next shooting lane. I'm going to squeeze something off. If I waited five steps, I'd have had a nice 10-foot shooting lane, nothing in my way you know, dead deer. Um, so if you're not comfortable, don't take the shot. Um, if you are comfortable and you see a little hole that you think you can make happen, take the shot. <laughs> Cause <laughs> that's right. That's, 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 I mean, it's, it's hard to say, but for a normal guy that's hunting the way we hunt that, you know, might not be on a food plot or whatever. Um, you're going to have to take some of those 
over the shoulder, got a spin in the stand. He's on the back door. He's trotting. I had to stop him, quartered away like bad situation shots. Um, and if you don't take those shots, you're not, you you know, you're going to struggle killing, killing deer in, in general. So, yeah, yeah. You, you've got to take your first, first uh, good shot you've got. I've learned over the years, you know, because it might be the only opportunity you get, you know, so but then with that said, you know, don't, don't take a shot. You're not comfortable with just like you said, cause yeah. uh, you know, that, that, that kind of screws up your season there. I mean, there's always a chance they're going to come back and you get a second chance if you, if you, you let them go. So. Yeah. And for the, the new bow hunters or, you know, people that are thinking about getting into it, listening, don't be afraid to practice on does, wipe them out. There's plenty of does out there. Um, gain your confidence. There's nothing better than smoking a doe. And you're like, Oh yeah, I'm on. Like there's just something, Man, about, that, you know, that, that's probably some of the best advice you could give right there, I would say, is, you know, the only way to get good at shooting deer is by just shooting deer, you know? So what better way to, to replicate a, a hunting scenario than going out and shooting a bunch of does and uh, yeah. managing your herd and filling, filling some antlerless tags and filling the freezer? Yep, shoot some coyotes. You get a chance to never pass a coyote. Shoot a coyote, you know, if it comes close enough, another great opportunity. <laughs> Um, the only bad thing is like, man, I'm about to waste thirty five dollars on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully he doesn't run off with my arrow. So, all right, <laughs> Matt. Well, I appreciate you tuning in, man. Uh, or uh, go ahead and give the listeners a place they can find you and a place they can find your heads if they're in the market. Yeah, well, I appreciate you bringing me on, and it was good talking to you. Uh, if you guys are interested, you can check us out on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok at rec underscore broadheads, and that's spelled R E K or uh, recbroadheads.com. All right, brother. Appreciate you. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed episode two here with Matt of the Going Back to the Basics. It was really fun to sit down and talk with him about, you know, the minute things about that moment. A lot of people, you know, they say, oh, he came in, blah, blah, blah. But you don't, they don't say, oh, you know, I drew at this moment. I did this. I was aiming here. Um, it was cool to just talk about that as different processes and uh, get everybody kind of thinking about that and their situation. Um, but uh, we're going to come out next week with episode three, and I do have a Legend of the Woods in the work. going to schedule to record that as well, um, get some of those in the off season. I know you guys love those, but really appreciate you tuning in, making this podcast possible. Exciting year going into 2023. Um, and always try, try to do the right thing, try to leave a legacy, and white till legacy is out. <laughs>